Fulus Abiris lived alone in a home by the sea. His home was not like the homes of the other people further inland. His home had been carved out of a cave on the side of the cliff, carved by his great-grandfather, and passed down from father to son until, finally, Fulus inherited it. He missed his mother and father every day, but his home had history. He didn't want to leave it behind. It had so many stories within its rocky, dusty walls. Some stories he knew because he lived them. Others he knew because his father and grandfather told him. Fulus loved stories, so much so that he began to tell them. Unlike the other writers who lived in the town close by, he did not write fantasy or science fiction, romance or suspense. He did not write mysteries either unless the stories he wrote had them. He wrote the stories of other people. Biographies. Nothing fascinated him more than hearing or reading the stories of other people. Real people. People who lived in flesh and blood and led brave or quiet or outrageous lives. Thankfully, people noticed how good he was at writing them. So people bought his books. And then people asked him to talk to real people. So he did. And people listened to him talk to real people. Seabank, as a little town of fewer than 500 people, had settled near the cliff by the sea. And if you asked anyone in Seabank who the most famous person in town would be, they would say, Felusibiris, no doubt. The radio show he hosted had him talking to strangers so listeners could hear their stories straight from the source. And people listened. Not just in the town of Seabank. People as far as 500 miles away could tune in, on radio or podcast. Felusibiris had listeners from as far as Inlay on the other side of the Blue Mountains. He did not host his show in his ancestral home. It didn't even have electricity. Everything in his home had to be lit with either log fires, candles, or storm lamps. He had been incredibly lucky that his father had the foresight to install running water when Fulus had been a young downy boy. No. To do his radio show, he would hike his way to the top of the cliff thanks to Ulus Pass, named after his great-grandfather, and then ride his bicycle into town to the WB49 radio station. Today, on his way to the station, he noticed something peculiar. Odd, even. He stopped his bike at the intersection of Main Street and Igvo Way, feeling the wind dance through the veins of his crest feathers, and he saw the townsfolk gathering on the sidewalks, staring at the same thing he was seeing. There, in front of the cafe, sat a limousine. Now, he and the residents had been used to tourists. Tourists were the driving force of Seabank, keeping their small town alive and the shops running. But Fulus had not seen a limousine in person since his college days so many years ago. He wondered aloud, why is this here? Standing next to him was Avery Mekekis, a capuchin man standing a bold four and a half feet tall, his tail curling around his ankles. He brushed a speck of sand off his tacky blue shirt, patterned all over with palm trees and beach balls. Some fancy folks came in, Avery said. Mayor's talking to them right now in Pearlie's. Pearlie's was the cafe the limousine parked in front of. I think it's some kind of magazine feature? Next to Felus and Avery, a gray cat woman approached. She wore glasses at the end of her nose, which only made her wide green eyes look even wider. This was Mrs. Brianne Ridgway, the oldest woman in town. I heard from my friend Jeannie, who works in the mayor's office, that some magazine out of Inlay wants to feature our town in their local vacation spots or something like that. Fulus nodded, though this confused him further. People came to Seabank to do articles on this town all the time, mostly to focus on the history of the place, or the indigenous people still residing there, or chasing the stories about the sea nymph who lived off the coast. None of the people before had come in a limousine. Avery asked, Do you know why the special treatment, ma'am? No clue, Mrs. Brienne admitted. Jeannie only told me what she knew. Fulus checked his watch. Though he had red and red-orange feathers of various lengths on his body, the feathers on his wrists and forearms were the color of burning logs, dark brown, nearly black. So his watch stood out on his feathers. He had an hour and a half before his show began. His original plan had been to go into the cafe and write a few more pages for his next biography project, but the limousine and the unusual mystery derailed his intentions. He pedaled up to the bike racks in front of the cafe, Pearlie's, and locked his bicycle into a free space. Then he went inside. To his surprise, no security tried to turn him away. 
He did, however, see the mayor sitting with a small crowd on the far right side of Pearlie's. The party had pulled two tables, each originally intended for four people, and pushed them together to seat the seven people present. The mayor, a human with dark brown skin and thick fingers and a bald head, spoke at length with a peregrine man, a red hawk man, Felus's feathers bristled at the presence of both of them, two Dalmatian men and two other humans. One had brown skin like wet rock on the beach, and the other... The other human had their back to him, so all he could see was their long, dark red hair. He could see their hair extended down to the middle of their back, loose and straight, draped over the back of a lilac purple dress. He turned away, lest anyone think he had been staring. He passed by the scattered tables and chairs, only one or two others of which were occupied with dining customers. He came to the counter, not sitting on one of the bar stools yet. Holly, the hen woman who waitressed at Pearlie's, approached him. Today, her golden comb, long and extending to her chest, had been pulled back by a red ribbon. The red matched the red on the walls. At least the red walls that were visible under the multitude of framed pictures. "'What'll you need, hun?" Holly asked. Felus replied, "'The usual, please. And anything you've heard about—' He blocked away from the new arrival so he could point to them without being seen by them. Holly clucked and turned around. "'Not much I can tell from that, I'm afraid,' she said. She popped the strainer off the espresso machine and poured the beans for Felus's usual order, a mocha with cookie shavings and cream. Felus had a sweet tooth, or a sweet beak, and was not ashamed to admit it. As Holly made the drink, she said, I can tell you now they're talking about a feature, but our town is a little backdrop for what they're planning. That raised the feathers on his crest with intrigue. He sat up straighter. Backdrop? Is this a movie? Nah, nothing that big, she said. She popped the filter back in, set a mug down under it, pressed a button, and let it roar to life. Holly and Felus waited for the machine to finish in an effort to not shout over it. The machine was old. Any sense of subtlety the espresso machine was capable of died the same day it lost its first fuse. After a while, the machine ceased its grind. Holly resumed while making the final touches for the order. It's not a movie. It's some kind of fashion shoot for a new label out of Inlay. Something to do with Wings of Peace, I think. He knew of Wings of Peace. One of his biography subjects, Holly Bluefeather, founded the organization with Orpex the Bald. The goal of Wings of Peace was to establish peaceful unity between the feathered peoples of Very Peninsula. They emerged after the Gold Talons, a pro-hawk hate group, started becoming more vocal and more visible in major cities. It did not surprise him then that Wings of Peace would be interested in Seabank. Besides its charming seaside cliff scenery and walkable town, and Felus himself, the town's biggest claim to fame was its founding, as a refuge for Little Feather people and other minorities that people like the Gold Talons and their predecessors, the Uberfolks, would persecute. Yes, a handful of hawk people lived in Seabank, but they were white owls and rabbit hops, ethnicities who were considered not hawk enough by whatever standards the extremists set. Holly passed Felus's order to him and said, don't be surprised if they want to talk to you, hun. He said, thanks, Holly. Settled onto a bar stool and got to writing. This has been a preview of Fui Shi Shi, the latest novella now available on Kickstarter. <laughs>